Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to this uh, part of the series describing photon and neutron in the quest to solve societal challenge and supported by the ASP, so the African School of Fundamental Physics and Application. So as a follow up of last week lecture by Dr. Andrew Jackson, so presenting the neutron as a natural tool for researcher. So today we are listening to our talented colleagues, so Pascal uh, Dean. Uh, as the second out of four talk presented by ESX expert. So we recall that in the part A, so there were six lectures so provided so by Professor Andrew Arisa, introducing the synchrotron and the neutron base diffraction and spectroscopy technique. So just to recall that, uh, so since the beginning of May, so the ASP community has produced uh, over uh, 60 lectures in the field of theoretical physics, experimental physics, and application. So all those uh, precious recording and prerequisite uh, so are available on our website, uh, so where you can find as well more information about our non-profit organization. So today, Pascal so can take the question during the presentation, so you can use uh, the chat box, uh, or you can keep question for the end if you want, or you can wave your hand virtually. Uh, and then uh, she can answer to that. So we have uh, about one hour or, or potentially less or more of presentation. And Pascal will make uh, her own introduction. So I will share the screen. And uh, so then Pascal, uh, the floor is yours or the screen is yours. Okay. No. I will share here. Like this. Here we go. Uh, I need to see. Yes, there we go. So, hello everyone. My name is uh, Pascal Dean, and my background is very much experimental condensed matter physics. I did a PhD uh, completed in 2003 uh, in experimental condensed matter physics at the University of Liverpool, where I looked at exchange coupling and superconductivity in light rare earth alloys and super lattices. And uh, this allowed me to perform quite a number of experiments at both a synchrotron source and neutron sources throughout Europe. Um, I continued that with a postdoctoral stint at the ESRF, the European, European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, uh, where I performed a significant number of resonant X-ray magnetic scattering measurements. And I started looking at uh, electronic and magnetic order in, in sort of uh, super lattice structures such as manganite and high TC superconducting uh, super lattices. I also performed quite a few high pressure measurements at that time that were very, very tricky. I followed that up with uh, a scientific position at the ILL, the Institut Lao Langeva, uh, until 2011 where I was responsible for the diffuse scattering spectrometer, uh, D7. And there I became interested in uh, diffuse magnetic order, frustration, spin glasses, strongly correlated systems, heavy fermion systems, and things like that. And then I was given the opportunity to become uh, a scientist focused on developing chopper spectroscopy and, and spectroscopy instrumentation at the ESS in Lund, which I took. Uh, and very pleased I did so. At the same time, or very close to that time, I was offered an adjunct position at the Niels Bohr Institute at the University of Copenhagen. So there I perform uh, science with students uh, and I focus on frustrating magnetism, heavy fermion physics and, and magnetocaloric materials. So that is my CV. Thank you. So then I stop sharing. Mm -hmm. So I will share my screen. So as Christine said, I would very much uh, appreciate if you, if you ask me questions during the time. Uh, whilst I speak, I really don't mind. If I don't see your question, please, Christine, you... you um, I, I can help you if you have to me. Yeah. yeah. So I wish to talk about, wait a minute, how do I... One moment, I want to make sure that no, I don't want to annotate. I want to make sure that I that was looking okay. Have a mouse. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. So 
Oh, I don't have a mouse. Okay, so I wish to talk about neutron scattering as a tool to understand quantum magnetism. Uh, let me try and get rid of... Sorry, you're the screen. There we go. Okay. Um, and at the end, I will talk about what this means for the European spallation source. So the overview of the talk is as follows. I show you a very basic overview of what magnetism is. I focus on neutron scattering and magnetism with particular focus on diffraction and then inelastic neutron scattering, which is the most important tool when it comes to studying magnetism. And then I look a little bit at the, the use of polarization analysis, which is something that uh, is, a, is a very uh, useful tool in, in the study of magnetism. Then I will look at some recent examples of the United States of matter, in particular some quantum behaviors, and then I will look at some relevant ESS instruments, not all but just one or two. So let's have a look at magnetism. So here, this is a very general talk, so I always like to start with the, um, the mineral that was found, first of all, which allowed us to sort of understand magnetism. This was lodestone found in magnesia in Turkey in 6th century BC, we believe. It's a natural magnet, uh, and it was used in early navigation. Lodestone typically is Fe3O4 plus uh, Fe2O3. What this means is you have, actually if I return, you have in purple the iron atoms and they are magnetized and in between they're linked with oxygen atoms and they're not magnetized. And these are magnetized in a ferromagnetic way and this means at all the moments, and we call them spins, the magnetic component are aligned along a single direction. So ferromagnets are very useful because we, we use them as electromagnets, we use them in electric mo motors, generators, transformers, etc. So this is something that is uh, very much part of our high technology society. What is the, um, the experimental signature of this state? Well, if you look at susceptibility, magnetic susceptibility, so the effect that you uh, see in a septometer is you see a paramagnetic state where everything is dis uh, is poorly aligned or disordered, uh, down to a temperature Tc uh, on the x-axis. And below that, the, magnet, the magnets, uh, the magnetic spins align because they overcome their thermal energy. So this is the signature in susceptibility. However, we have many, many other types of magnetic orders, of course we do. Uh, and one very interesting one that came to light in the 1940s and 1950s was the idea of antiferromagnetism, where on adjacent spins, you have a spin pointing up and a spin pointing down. So a magnetic component pointing up and a magnetic component pointing down next to it. This is something that uh, was believed should be seen in a compound called manganese oxide. What is the signature of that? Well, if you look again at susceptibility measurements, you have transition temperature. In this case, it should be a TN. I will explain that in a moment. Uh, and below TN, instead of the susceptibility increasing significantly, it decreases such that at the lowest temperature, the susceptibility is really nothing because of course you have to counter a parallel magnetic moments, which on average ends up being zero. So there's no variation with magnetic field at the lowest temperatures, um, unless you manage to polarize the system. The reason why we call this a hidden order is because the actual ordering arrangements uh, are unclear from the susceptibility. It's very difficult to figure out what that is. It could be an ordering like I show here on the top, where you have anti-parallel arrangements, or you could have different types of arrangements, maybe a cyclical arrangement or something else. So this is why it's called a hidden order. Um, there was a, an intense theoretical debate. Guinelle, 
described this magnetic order as a mean in within a mean field theory. He described it as magnetic order on two sublattices. And that's sort of how we how we show it these days. We showed it in a macro, as a macroscopic picture. Lev Landau, in contrast, said that these were fluctuating, fluctuating spins in opposition and therefore have no time average moment. And he associated this very much with a quantum state. So what is it? Well, first of all, let's see uh, how we can understand this in terms of neutron scattering and magnetism. So keep in mind that we want to understand manganese oxide or antiferromagnetism, but first of all, we need the tools to do that. And first of all, of course, 1932, you've had some of these overviews, but now I'm going to focus them on magnetic scattering uh, with neutrons. So first of all, 1932, we had the discovery of the neutron. Questions then were, what is the neutron spin? What is the neutron magnetic moment? How do neutrons scatter from magnetic atoms? This was very unclear. In 1936-37, Bloch realized that there was a classical dipole-dipole interaction with a magnetic moment of a half uh, transferring to 1.91 mu n. So they understood exactly how, what a magnetic moment the neutron had and how it could interact with materials. That was quite a large step forward. Beyond that, I don't expect you to read this slide, but it's just interesting. Now we're at 1938 and Halpin and Johnson were able to calculate the interaction potential. Uh, such as the nuclear, magnetic, and incoherent contributions. So you've already heard about these contributions, but they were calculated in 1938. And I think what is important to understand is that there is no equivalent interaction for X-rays or any other probe, really. So it, it was a very large step forward. Neutron scattering, the intensity that we measure, which is the partial differential scattering function, what we measure are the number of neutrons scattered per second into a solid angle with a final energy between EF and then an other uh, energy loss or energy gain, divided, of course, by some normalization factor. And this can be linked to the sum of all the processes. So the processes, it's a shame I can't point to it, but the processes are the states of the scatterer changes from lambda to lambda dash. Uh, the wave vector spatial direction changes from k to k dash. Uh, the spin state of the neutron changes from s to s dash if there is a spin, if there's a magnetic contribution. And this is all within a solid angle. Now, what's very good about this is that the neutron scattering cross section directly links experiment to theory. And we, we separate the probe from the um, phenomena within the material. And this is an absolute unit. So it's a, very, uh, it's a very useful tool to in order to compare theory to experiment. And this is something that we do all the time now. Um, magnetic neutron scattering has, uh, of course, contributions from the spin and the orbital contribution. And you see as a function of space of Q, wave vector transfer, which is the difference between Ki and Kf, um, that we have contributions due to the spin moment and the orbital moment. This means that we only have scattering at lower Q, lower uh, spatial contributions, and the moments normal to, con to Q contribute. Now, going back to uh, how this, how this was seen within, within society. Well, there was a Nobel Prize awarded to Schull and Brockhaus for the pioneering contribution to the development of neutron scattering techniques for the study of condensed matter. And Schull, the way that the prize was awarded, and I think this is very useful, Schull was awarded the prize for development of neutron diffraction, showing where atoms or spins are and Bertrand Bockhaus was, was awarded the prize for the development of neutron spectroscopy, what atoms or spins do. And here we get back to manganese oxide. So Schull and Smart uh, published a paper in 1949, which showed exactly what sort of magnetic ordering we had in manganese oxide. So at 
the highest temperature, so the lowest uh, figure there. So you have along the x-axis, you have uh, the detector angle, which is related to Q, and then at, on the y-axis, you have intensity. And you see that there are two main Bragg peaks. You've got some low angle scattering, but those Bragg peaks relate to the, the correlation length of the atoms, the atomic positions, let's say. As you cool down the temperature to 80 Kelvin, you see extra Bragg peaks popping up, and these relate directly to the position or the alignment of the manganese oxide, the manganese spins, the manganese magnetic moments, which are aligned pa parallel, and therefore you get a Bragg peak at the half position. So we now know where the atoms or the spins are and, what, and how they behave as a function of temperature. So here, if you take the integrated intensity of such a peak and you go below the transition temperature, of course, you start to increase uh, your intensity because you have aligned or you have um, polarized in, a, in an antiferromagnetic manner, the spins. Uh, and then what happened was in 1972, quite a bit later, uh, a study on the manganese oxide spin waves, which meant how they moved. Now here, what you see again, the figures uh, are slightly different. On the, the x-axis, you have Q, so wave vector transfer, which you're all familiar with. But now on the y-axis, you have energy transfer, the energy loss of the neutron as it, as it hits the crystal. Uh, and I will talk a bit more about that in a moment. So first of all, sorry, let me just say, okay. So elastic scattering and diffraction, I think this is something that uh, Andrew Harrison and Andrew Jackson both have discussed. We all know about Bragg's law. We all know about coherent scattering from a crystal lattice and how this is reflected into a diffraction pattern with very discrete uh, magnetic uh, or structural Bragg peaks, I mean to say. If you then, so this is what it would look like as a uh, powder pattern on the right. If you then, sorry, this is wrong. If you then have an antiferromagnetic structure, you have to have, you end up with magnetic Bragg peaks in between these uh, structural Bragg peaks and indeed on the Q pattern, which is a, of a, of a single crystal, you end up having Bragg peaks centrally positioned in between the nuclear Bragg peaks. So here we're only interested in the atomic positions or the spin positions, and we understand the static correlations. Again, what's important is we have to think about form factors. The absolute intensity of the Bragg peaks depends on where you are in Q and that depends, uh, the absolute intensity depends on the magnetic uh, cross-section, the magnetic contribution, the spin and orbital contributions um, that the neutron sees. Because of course, as you know, the scattering contribution is the Fourier transform of the um, spin contribution or the orbital contribution. And that, because it's not uh, sitting as a point-like source, has a um, sine theta over lambda contribution. This is similar to X-rays, which are, which are scattered of the charge of the atom. And therefore you see a very similar contribution. Of course, the cross sections are very different. So now inelastic neutron scattering, and this is something that, that is less spoken about in general neutron scattering courses. So inelastic neutron scattering, uh, Bertrand Brockhaus was awarded the prize, as I said, development of neutron spectroscopy, showing what atoms and spins do, how they move. So here again, as I said, we have the uh, energy transfer versus Q relation of manganese oxide showing how the spin waves move. What I first would like to say is that uh, it's difficult to understand how the spins move if we don't understand, first of all, how the lattice moves. So most of us understand that phonons 
are collective excitations and they are the production of a sound. So you have compressive uh, motion of the atoms within a crystal lattice. Um, we, we can access this with neutron scattering because the neutrons have an energy scale that is directly, that is very close to the energy scale of the, of the crystal lattice. Uh, and this allows the neutron to interact with the lattice. And what I want to show here is uh, such a pattern that you get in neutron inelastic scattering. So on the x-axis you have Q or uh, K, it gives you spatial information. On the y-axis you have dynamic information. The way that we understand this is we imagine uh, an atomic structure with the atoms interlinked with springs. The repeatability of the structure is uh, every interatomic spacing D. So lambda, the repeatability is D. At zero energy, so there's no interaction with the neutron uh, scattering cross-section and there is no movement either. Therefore, we sit at zero. This is the red dot I want to show here. If you then uh, have the neutron interacting with these atoms. Of course, these atoms are going to move. Some are going to move closer to each other. Some are going to move further away. And the repeatability of the pattern changes. At this position here, where I show in red, the repeatability of the pattern is now 4D for interatomic inter spacings. So K becomes 2 pi over 4D. And the energy transfer that the neutron has given to the lab, so the neutron has lost, is now at a higher level. And this can be continued as you uh, increase the energy, you see that the pattern changes again. Now this very distinctive pattern here is the distinctive pattern of a phonon and the absolutely highest energy scale that this phonon produces is very much linked to the interaction strength, the, the interaction strength of the, uh, at, of the um, springs in between the atoms, if one wishes to say that they are springs. So this is a very useful tool, of course. If, and this uh, was observed fairly uh, quickly after uh, the development of the triple axis. And here we show the uh, collective excitations in diamond. So the phonons in diamond, and you see that there are quite a few and they are well understood. Now, the inelastic scattering of uh, spins are something slightly different. And here I want to go to a, sorry, just a moment, to another screen where I have taken the website of the ILL. And this is a beautiful graphic performed by, uh, created by Alan Filo of the ILL. Um, I suggest you all go and find it because it's very nice. And what this graphic does, uh, can everybody see it? Yeah, that works. Yeah, excellent. Uh, what this graphic does is show spins moving around and interacting at a very high temperature. So what I show here at the bottom is a temperature versus magnetic field scale. And then we go into an ordered state, let's say, and here we have an antiferromagnetically ordered state and we see the, the movement of, uh, of the spins uh, due to thermal fluctuations. If we now bounce a neutron of this state, you see the spin wave developing. The neutron has given some energy to the spins and you see the movement of the spins. So this is for an antiferromagnet. If we then polarize this, oh, I have to wait for the perturbation to end. Okay, if we polarize the state, you see the spins rotating as they should do around the magnetic field. And again, if we perturb it with a neutron, you see the spin wave developing and you see quite clearly the spin wave is, is quite different for the ferromagnetic state to the antiferromagnetic state. So I think that's a very useful demonstration. So I will go back to my talk now.
So here we show ferromagnetism, and here I show on the bottom antiferromagnetism. And here we have the spin waves corresponding to the interaction of the neutron with uh, the ferromagnetic state. And here we have an antiferromagnetic spin wave. In the same way, if we think about uh, what the collective excitation of uh, a ferromagnet is, so we, again, we look at the uh, spatial versus energy scale, and we see that for a ferromagnet, first of all, at zero energy, no interaction with the neutron, everything is aligned, so we have no energy. And then you start seeing in a similar way how the neutron interacts with the, uh, the system. For a ferromagnet, it's very well defined. The relationship between the energy transfer of the neutron to the system uh, is proportional to Sj, J being the exchange interaction between the spins, and has a one minus cos dependence, cos QA dependence, uh, where the, the maximum energy scale is given then by the exchange interaction and the spin state, 8Sj. So that's really very useful information. For an antiferromagnet, you have something slightly different. Um, it's also very clearly defined that you have the spatial information versus energy transfer. And you see that now the relationship, the energy transfer is related by a sine of QA and then 4S of J. And the maximum energy is now 4S of J. Again, this is uh, very useful to extract exchange um, interactions, etc. And what I show here are two examples. On the left, we have samarium strontium manganese oxide, and I show the spin waves in, uh, in this ferromagnetic system along different crystalline axes. Uh, you see Q on the x-axis and energy transfer on the y-axis. Uh, and again, I show you manganese oxide on the, on the right as a, as a comparison. What we do these days are not just uh, single plots or single dimensions, a single crystal as we use typically now, because it gives us uh, direction, information on directionality, has a four dimensional space. Of course, it has three, three uh, Cartesian directions plus the energy transfer. And this you see on this plot on the left. So QX and QY, it's difficult to access QX, QY and QZ at the same time. So QX and QY you typically access. And then along the uh, Y axis, you have energy transfer. And you see the very well defined uh, inelastic excitations, and then the um, elastic information gives you information on the spin structure. So it's important to note when you do a diffraction experiment and you integrate within energy, you are integrating over the energy transfer or the spin waves or the phonons that are within your system. They're often much, much weaker than your elastic scattering contribution. Um, so you may uh, count them out. However, it should be impo it's important to know that they are there. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about polarization analysis. So polarization analysis came, although we understood that the, that the neutron had a magnetic spin, and therefore it should have either a spin up or a spin down, as I show here. It took a while to understand exactly what that meant. And that work came about in 1968 with Moon, Reese and Cooler, who did a first <clears throat> comprehensive experimental work showing how we can look at uh, polarized spin states, an illustration of polarization analysis. So what this means is, if we look from the left to the right, um, neutrons, when they are produced in a moderator, will have both spin states. They make no distinction between it. But then after that, you can have something called a polarizer or a flipper. Um, I'm not going to describe how it is, but this creates uh, or lets through a single spin state. <coughs> This single spin state interacts with the sample and will scatter either 
a spin down or a spin up, which we will then analyze. So what I show here on the right, these four different spin states are uh, different cross sections that you can uh, achieve where you come in with a spin up and you measure a spin up, come in with a spin down, you measure a spin down, you come in with a spin down, you go measure a spin up, etc. And this is very useful uh, in particular for magnetic scattering, as you can imagine. So what I show here is uh, the work by Moon, Reese and Cooler on manganese F2. And what I show here on the top is an unpolarized beam. So you see the magnetic form factor at low scattering angles, and then you see the, um, the nuclear scattering peaks uh, of the crystal. Now, when you turn the flipper off, you only access the nuclear contribution. So you see here, you only see the nuclear Bragg peaks. And with the flipper on, you only access the magnetic contribution, which is the magnetic form factor that I spoke about before. So it's paramagnetic scattering above the transition temperature. So this is a very important tool in our studies of magnetism using neutron scattering. So what I would like to talk now about is I've spoken to you about uh, diffraction, inelastic neutron scattering, both phonons and magnons, and polarization analysis. And I want to show you a little bit how we use or what sort of information we get out. And I will talk about ytterbium manganese oxide, which is a multiferroic material. So you have the interplay between ferromagnetic and ferroelectricity. Uh, these materials are seen as very useful in, uh, for technological purposes. And in particular in this material, we see a very strong interplay between magnons and phonons which is uh, quite important to understand these materials. And then after that, I want to talk a little bit about a very recent result by Bella Lake's group on a three-dimensional quantum spin liquid. As some quantum spin liquid is a very uh, novel state of matter that, that we hope to use in the future. So in this material, terbium manganese oxide, we have uh, measured the excitations at uh, different regions of reciprocal space. So here you have the crystal structure on the right and we had a single crystal. So we're able to look at various regions of reciprocal space and use polarization analysis to extract the phonon signal here on the left and the magnon signal here on the, in the second picture at two Kelvin below the transition temperature. And then the magnon sig signal, as you polarize absolutely the, uh, the material, and then the magnon and phonon signal together. What you get out of such, such a pattern is you get the exchange interaction, you get if there is any strong anisotropy within your system, and we also see that there is magnon phonon hybridization. These uh, exchange interactions and these details are important if we wish to optimize these materials for technological purposes. What I want to show you more so is here in this image. These are the theoretical uh, calculations performed on this material to understand absolutely uh, what is happening in this material. And I think that you see very clearly that we have a very uh, good understanding of what is happening in this material. You see the excitations, uh, the line shapes are narrower because the instrument adds a resolution effect to the line shapes. You see uh, the excitation spectrum and you see the correct gap. We're missing something slightly from the central uh, image. Uh, and you see that we can separate the magnons and the phonons really very well. In order to get such uh, data, we need to study a broad region of both energy and um, wave vector transfer. As you can see, you need very high energy resolution and both Q, Q and energy resolution. You need a very high signal to noise. Uh, these data 
sit quite close to the elastic line where the Bragg scattering, as I said before, the Bragg scattering will dominate um, the inelastic scattering. So you need to make sure that everything is very clean. And this allows us to understand the interplay between phonons and magnons. The other thing I would like to point out here is the energy scale. Uh, here we have an energy transfer up to 20 milli electron volts. Those are uh, quite low energies and are difficult to achieve with X-rays. Certainly the energy resolution that you need to, to perform these measurements. Now I'd like to talk about quantum spin liquids. So I think uh, a lot of people have heard about uh, spin liquids, or at least a lot of people have heard about the possibility to use quantum computing uh, in our future to drive and manipulate quantum effects to, uh, as a means to improve our high technology uh, society indeed. So in order to do that, we need to understand coherence, which is a, an effect in uh, quantum states of matter that do not have a classical analog entanglement, superposition, and quantum transport. These all do not have analogs in the classical world. We believe we will use these for quantum computing. Um, quantum computing has advanced quite a lot with uh, optical, with photons, but we haven't advanced quite as much with uh, spin states of matter, which are by definition a quantum state. We believe that we will be able to do so if we understand uh, a quantum spin liquid. A quantum spin liquid are entangled states of matter, and this is what I show here on the very right. You have a spin on one side or a magnetic moment on one side, which is correlated uh, to a spin quite a long distance away in, in a disordered manner, in a sense. Uh, so it doesn't break any symmetry. There is no real magnetic order. It's a disordered system. And it shows uh, something called fractionalized excitations. So we need to understand the dynamics of these materials. We believe that most of the, most of the materials that will display quantum spin liquids uh, will show a triangular structure, such as those I, I show here, a Kagame structure, triangular structure, pyrochlor, or a hyperkagame structure. The typical scenario whereby you go below a thermal, a certain temperature and the thermal, the thermal um, fluctuations are no longer enough to hold, well, the thermal fluctuations are gone and the magnetic excitations come up. This doesn't apply in quantum spin liquids. Like I said, there is no broken symmetry. So there is a huge search on to try and find such materials. And the first, well, not the first, but a, a very prominent material to show such things is this material here, Herbert Smithite, which is a mineral that one can find in nature. Um, I was involved in some work looking at such a material, a material called Volborthite, and you see the crystal structure here. Uh, it has hydrogen, so I think you would have heard previously that hydrogen contains a lot of incoherent scattering, and this makes the, the neutron scattering experiments very difficult because it gives a very broad background. So this material shows all the signs that we need. It has a triangular pattern, a Kagame lattice. It doesn't order down to very low temperatures. It has a copper spin, uh, which is required to achieve the quantum state. Um, and so we looked at this material on D7, and what you see as uh, the total scattering profile is what I show you here in green. Uh, you have a very large background, you have Bragg peaks, etc. When we perform polarization analysis, we can separate the total scattering or the nuclear scattering from the total scattering. So this is the structure, the nuclear structure. This is the spinning coherent scattering. Uh, from the hydrogen incoherent cross-section. And then what we're interested in is this very small contribution here, magnetic scattering. Clearly that is impossible to achieve with our polarization analysis. And you will possibly say now that it really is very weak. And it certainly is. 
Uh, however, it gave us uh, confidence that we really have a spin liquid. We have a disordered system. You don't see any bright peaks. Um, and this determination was not possible without polarization analysis. What I show here in red uh, is an expectation for uh, a short range disordered system as you would expect. So I think that shows really the strength of polarization analysis. Beyond that, um, another group were able to study the excitations in this uh, two-dimensional spin liquid state. They were able to uh, synthesize Herbert Smith out without uh, the hydrogen, instead they had uh, deuterium. And you see again that this crystal, uh, this system has a very beautiful Kagame lattice. They were able to grow these five millimeter, well, one centimeter long crystals, and they were able to look at the spin excitations in this material. So here, in the middle image here shows the spin ex um, wave vector transfer on the x-axis, energy transfer on the y-axis. And you see that there is a continuum of scattering. What I want to show you here is that this is very different to the conventional scattering profiles that I showed you earlier on for phonons and magnons, uh, the collective excitations that we see here. If we then cut uh, along a certain energy at a certain energy position, what you see are these very beautiful excitation patterns. And these are representative of fractionalized excitations that we expect in these spin liquid um, materials. So there are no well-defined excitations and correlations, but we do have these fractionalized excitations. So for a long time, this material was seen as the prototype of a spin liquid. And now we are looking at many more materials because it transpires that there is not just one spin liquid, there are many different types. We're, we're at, the, at the start of quite an exciting few years, we imagine, of discovery of all sorts, different types of spin liquids so that we can compartmentalize them into uh, different magnetically ordered states in the way that we did with uh, conventional magnetism. And one of these is the three-dimensional spin liquid state in lead, copper, telluride. Uh, this is work done by Bella Lake. And what they did was they were able to extract the exchange interactions, the true exchange interactions for a system that shows no ordering at all in any dimension, in any direction. So here you see the susceptibility as a function of temperature, so no magnetic ordering. And then the spin excitations, which as I said before, is the key to understanding this material, um, shows these really weak diffuse scattering profiles that are not at all consistent with the collective excitations we expect from more classical materials. Um, so I think that's a, a very exciting and new promising uh, field of study that is, that is uh, very prominent at this moment in time in condensed matter physics. So, where are we uh, with neutron scattering at the ESS and why is the ESS being built? Um, I think you probably have already been told this, but it's because we need more flux. We need to be able to measure single crystals that are higher quality and therefore are often smaller. Um, to date, we have examples of people aligning up to 200 small single crystals to get a single point on the phase diagram. That's what I show here on the left. Uh, and that, that is very time consuming and very difficult. Uh, so we need to have smaller single crystals. They will have fewer imperfections. We want to look at uh, materials that have been grown by high pressure synthesis. They tend to be grown in very small amounts and this will show a sort of global behavior in this. We haven't been able to look at these very frequently now. We would like to study many stoichiometries, of course, to be able to understand phase diagrams and how uh, a stoichiometry alters the phase diagram and the exchange interactions, study high absorption isotopes and study magnetic multilayers. Beyond that, we want to apply high pressure. We want to perturb the system to understand the system. So we want to apply high pressure higher magnetic fields, but of course, to do that, you have a smaller uh, surface area or a volume that you can scatter from. And I show here on the right, a, a pressure cell that was developed in 2013. And you see the difficulty that, that uh, occurs 
that is created once you wish to apply high pressure in a high magnetic field. Beyond that, we would like to do out of equilibrium physics. We would like to see if we perturb state, how does it uh, fluctuate or how does it come back to its natural state? So of course, uh, this probably has also been shown, but I think it's very useful. We will try and use the five megawatt long pulse nature of the ESS in comparison to the short pulse nature of uh, the other facilities or the short pulse facilities uh, to extract as much flux as possible, thus allowing us to uh, look at smaller samples, look at different systems. The ESS instrument suite uh, is quite broad. We have 15 instruments that we intend to build by 2025. And for magnetism, I mean, an awful lot of these materials are very, or these instruments are very suitable for, for magnetic purposes. And you see that by the small magnet, uh, the magnetic cartoon that we show here. Uh, in particular, the instruments um, MAGIC, DREAM, C-SPEC, T-REX and B-FROST will be heavily used for the study of magnetic materials. And you see that they're separated, subdivided into large scale structures for small angle neutron scattering, diffraction and spectroscopy. Diffraction and spectroscopy will be the tools that we use to look at quantum materials. Uh, and I show this again. Um, I'm sure you've seen this before. This is an overview of the ESS. We have the protons coming from the left, hitting the target and sc scattering within the moderator into the various instruments. And the instruments that I was, I'm going to talk to you about are C-SPEC here at the top and MAGIC long haul as well. Uh, right beside T-Rex and Miracles. So these instruments are 160 meters long and well, will be very useful for uh, magnetism. So the first instrument I'd like to talk to you about is MAGIC. It's a diffraction instrument. It's uh, an instrument that is built between PSI ULIC and the LLB. And you see the relative contributions. It's a bispectral instrument, which means that it looks at both thermal and cold neutrons. It can extract both um, and it will have a very high flux. It's a polarized instrument, completely polarized, um, which, is, which makes it uh, a very useful tool, of course, for magnetism, as I, as I said. Um, it has flexible longitudinal and transverse resolutions, which means that you can really access and look at various regions of reciprocal space. Importantly, it will be able to focus on sub-millimeter cubed samples. To date, we tend to study centimeter cubed samples. So to start looking at sub-millimeter cubed samples is really quite impressive. Then a uh, quick overview of C-SPEC. So this is the instrument that I'm responsible for. So it's a cold chopper spectrometer of the ESS. Sorry, just to go back to MAGIC, this is the diffraction instrument and then the correlated sort of spectroscopy instrument is C-SPEC. The energy, it is a cold chopper spectrometer. So it will access energies up to 20 milli electron volts. And I think if you Remember the energy scales of both the quantum spin liquid and the turbine manganese oxide systems, all of the excitations are up to about 20 milli electron volts. Uh, this instrument has a short bandwidth because it's a long instrument. It has a very good energy resolution, one to 5% of instant energy, and it will access sample sizes, which are significantly larger than those of MAGIC, the diffraction instrument, but remember that it's actually very difficult uh, to extract information from an inelastic signal. So you cannot expect to go as small. Uh, and in an upgrade, it will also have polarization analysis. So what I show here is the beam line from the monolith and moderator out into the bunker, out into the different holes. We have different choppers allowing us to extract various wavelength bands. And then we hit the sample area with the S and then we uh, detect on a detector area, which is uh, about 
steradian. So it's a huge detector area. The sample to detector area, just to give you an idea, is 3.5 meters. Uh, so this is a huge tank. It will give us a very broad overview of S, Q, and omega. The way that we work is we will we expect to have significantly more flux beyond the extra flux provided by the ESS, but we will we intend to add up a number of pulses. What I show here is a time distance diagram. Um, essentially, what this does is we have lots of different wavelengths that are very close in energy beside each other, and then we add them up when possible to gain flux. Uh, and this is possible when the energy resolutions are very close uh, for different wavelengths. So I, the message, I don't expect you to understand if you haven't looked at time distance diagrams before, but the message is we gain flux, uh, significant flux to be able to do that. Uh, and this I show here. So as a function of energy resolution, we have intensity on the y-axis. And here we compare other uh, very significant uh, chopper spectrometers throughout the world, and we intend to have an order of magnitude in flux. So then the other uh, aspect of this instrument is that it has to have less noise. I think I showed you that the, the signals of a quantum spin liquid are very broad. They're continuous. They are weak, so they're slightly above background. So you really make, need to make sure that your background is uh, very low. And we do this by making sure that we are far away vertically from the moderator. So we curve our guide out of line of sight, and then we transport neutrons along there. So you see that this is very effective because in between the pulses that the uh, the proton pulse in between the proton pulse hitting the target, we should have a uh, a free region, uh, a background free region, which is something that you do not have at a reactor. So there should be no ambient background, um, indeed. So we have higher flux, much less noise, so we should be able to access really very interesting uh, new states. So I want to show you some production pictures. Here we have some guide production, which is done at uh, TUM, uh, reactor facility in Germany. Here we have our second instrument scientist standing on our guide shielding. And here we have an image of the detector tank, which will go into manufacturing very soon. And we hope to be ready in December 22. So all this, both MAGIC and C-SPEC will sit in this very large uh, instrument hall um, and it will be filled up and it's an exciting time to uh, to be here and see this filling up. So that is all that I have. Uh, this was the ESS in December 2020. Um, I think to get an idea of the scale you really need to recognize, actually I can't really see a person, we need to see the small, the cars and, and see how big this facility is with uh, C-Spec and MAGIC sitting in the very far hall uh, of the long hall there on the left top side. So that is all. Uh, if you have any questions, then my email address is on the last side. Well, very good. So we have, uh, yeah, quite a, a long, uh, text by Alex, so I will read of that. Um, so is there any easy question first, uh, looking at uh, the presentation from Pascal, and then we come to Alex, come on. Maybe you have time to read then, Pascal. So I see the one from Alex, thank you. Can you talk us through how you use the data from a typical neutral spectroscopy experiment to understand the properties of a material and generate the pretty pictures and animations you've shown? Do you always have to start with a very well-defined theoretical model to compare with what other experiments should you have done first to make the most of neutral spectroscopy results? So the very first thing one always does is a specific heat and susceptibility measurement. Uh, then you do X-ray diffraction. You need to know uh, your you need to know your atomic structure. You cannot do an experiment on the excitations until you know very well your atomic structure. 
Um, so you do that with x-rays and then you look at diffraction with neutrons because you're, as you know, x-rays are not very sensitive to oxygen and neutrons are, and lots of these materials are oxides. So we, you do all these measurements first before you even consider doing an inelastic neutron scattering experiment. Once you do an inelastic neutron scattering experiment, you, there are things you can do. You can look at, um, it depends what you're looking at. For a spin liquid, we're still very far away from having any theoretical, proper theoretical insight. But if you have a, um, a more simple classical system, uh, multiferroic or something like that, then you are able to use the more generic tools uh, that I showed. You can look at how far up does your excitation spectrum go? What is the lifetime of your, of your uh, spin state? Uh, is your system gapped or not gapped? Do you have a gap? Which means that you have some anisotropy in your in your system and things like that. But these days you do not publish anything without uh, theoretical comparison. Thanks, great answer. It has to be uh, good. It's a good question. Um, do we have any other questions about students or advanced students because we are students for life? Yes, sir. so Lawrence. Sir. Are these experiments done on intrinsically disordered materials? Um, so usually, the if you're talking about the spin liquids, the crystal structure is not disordered at all. It is the spin structure that is disordered. Um, so, and that, that's the interesting thing. And intrinsically disordered, in disordered systems, you still end up with a lot of correlations. And what would be the difference for instance, if you look at the same sample with the light source, for instance? Well, x-rays, um, so the problem with x-rays, it's not a problem. First of all, you need to consider that the x-ray uh, scatters off the charge density cloud. So you can do measurements, you can do uh, inelastic x-ray measurements, but their energy resolutions are very poor and they will not match the energy resolutions that we have. The other problem, and I, I maybe didn't mention this, but a spin liquid is disordered down to the lowest temperatures. So we typically measure at millikelvin temperatures. An X-ray interacting with matter at that will always heat up a temperature. Um, and so you cannot access millikelvin temperatures because you heat up uh, the mm -hmm. material too much. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things indeed, uh, uh, Lawrence, that uh, I think it was described as well this morning uh, in the presentation from the brightness, which was quite interesting. And, and one of the examples they had was also about uh, this, uh, for the, the oxygen activation, I mean, looking at on, the, yeah, on the, the iron, how it could be potentially measured. So with those lights also, then I guess yeah, with neutron, I mean then you would not have this type of... Um, Bad. No, if you, if you wish to look at the valence state of the oxygens, then you need to go to a synchrotron source. Okay. You need to do uh, some sort of fluorescence measurements to do that. Uh, and that, but that's all part of it. I mean, the to really understand your material, you need to do. There are lots of people who do both uh, types of measurements. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, yeah. Where do you find so Niels? Yeah. asks me, where do you find quantum spin liquids? You can find them naturally. Uh, I don't know where you can mine them. I think you probably know this better, uh, but I know that they are natural minerals. Um, they are, at the moment, they are still being used. So the question is, are these, system, these quantum spin liquids useful or are they rather being used as model systems to learn about quantum coherence? Um, they are currently, we, they are still being used as model systems to try and understand and, and compartmentalize them. Uh, they are still model systems. We don't know enough about them. If we wish to use them in the real world, then we would need to start looking at uh, nanostructures and how these materials behave on the, sort of in a nanostructure. 
Um, but we are very far from that. We don't quite yet know the excitations in these materials. We don't understand the exchange interactions that lead to it. What makes a quantum spin liquid? Lots of these systems do disorder, I do, sorry, order. Um, and so a quantum spin liquid is still something that is few and far between. It still produces, if you find a system that is a true quantum spin liquid, with all of the relevant signatures, it's still a nature and a science paper. We're not at the state where we have hundreds of quantum spin liquids. How about macromolecules like metal containing enzymes? Um, I don't know. Sorry, Lawrence, but I don't know. How many times are these experiments done a day? Or will be? Uh, it, do you mean how many experiments will be done in a single day at the ESS or how many, how long does it take to do such an experiment? So do you have a microphone? So maybe Kapoor or do you want to make some guess? You're, you're speaking about, for instance, with the um, suspect? So these experiments currently take uh, several, they take four to five days to perform such an experiment. Um, First of all, you need to get to very low temperatures. You need to make sure your crystals aligned. The scattering profiles, the scattering interaction is very, very weak. So you need to count very long time. If you have a single crystal, you have to make sure that you cover a good proportion of uh, wave vector transfer. Uh, so then beyond that, it depends how many uh, chopper spectrometers, how many instruments do you have to perform these experiments? And there are not that six, seven worldwide. So the, the idea that we will improve uh, our signal to noise is really important, really crucial to, to try and get this field moving further. Well, thanks to the high flux. Huh? That we have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, you, you presented as well the, um, the volt bit. So that was quite an interesting material as well. So this is an experiment that you run, I think the D7, this is at the ILL, no? Yes. That, that's yes. something that you intend as well to do with the, the CSPEC or the MAGIC? Yes, or yeah, 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 definitely. To benchmark um, it somehow, potentially? Yeah. Well, I would probably, we probably not to benchmark that one, but it would be very nice to deuterate that system and then um, do some more experiments on it. Volborthite in itself has lots of issues with uh, impurities. That's why in the end, it was the material Herbert Smithite, which is very similar, which uh, was shown to be a tree spin liquid. The, in lots of these materials, you end up with a lot of impurities that, that, uh, that uh, cause the spin liquid phase to be destroyed. So it means that the smaller than it is, the better it is. So the highest flux will be an advantage as well. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's sort of the point. If you create, um, so some, a very prominent neutron scatter called Ross Stewart said to me once, the rule of thumb with neutron scattering is that we use a sample the size of a thumb uh, when we do neutron scattering. And that means that those samples are very unique. They don't exist in many cases, they're, they're quite unusual. So we're studying systems that are really quite unusual. And we need to start studying systems that are, that are more commonplace. So we could synthesize as well such type of structure by trying to understand maybe with this sample environment, something specific so that we can create them. So it would be the magic material. Yeah. So, so what we are doing is we're working a lot with uh, Lund University where you can synthesize materials. I work with uh, groups in Copenhagen as well uh, to create uh, these materials. Niels is, is part of this. Uh, question is, will the ESS have a medical use beamline? No, uh, the decision was made that we would be a materials uh, research facility and we would not use our facility for medical uh, applications. Um, of course, this decision may change as the need arises, but the, this was the decision that was made 10 years ago. But it, it could be somehow expanded as well to think about the, the pharma 
pharmaceutical aspect of that as well. So in medical, so it may be not biology per se, even if there are some, some kind of testing that Zoe is doing, for instance, huh? which could be yeah, considered yeah, a bit of course. for that. I mean, yeah. research, yeah. The research on uh, medical materials and COVID proteins, etc. Yes, we have a macromolecular instrument called NMX where such structures, the structure of these proteins will be, will be studied. But I understood a medical use beamline will be where you, there are facilities where you have people who come and they have proton beam therapy and things like that. We won't do that. But of course we, medical drugs, um, you know, these are, these are materials that we need to understand and we will certainly do that. Yeah, this is true. It's not the, the proton therapy and all those uh, other aspects. No. That's right. Okay, excellent. So more question overall? Uh, we have also possibility to ask you more questions later on. I think that we have, uh, or I will capture the, all of that as well on the website, so on the Indigo, the so once we put the presentation and as well, on the, the website, uh, so from the, the African Nights also, that will be very nice at the moment, so to bring as well some synergy there. And uh, we will uh, um, have, uh, I think, certainly more questions later on. So, and, and it's really important that, uh, that we make sure as well that for, for the high temperature superconductor, so we have as well some kind of uh, good instrument as well that will be developed, so thanks to you, <laughs> yeah. So, so like, I didn't, I didn't speak, I didn't speak about that. But both, yeah, there are quite, there are quite a few uh, instruments that will focus on high temp. Well, there's one in particular called Bfrost, mm -hmm. which uh, Niels is actively involved in, um, and it sits right beside C-spec. So both C-spec and Bfrost will will be used to study high temperature superconductors. But I didn't, I didn't speak about that because, uh, well, there that's right. It will be my question. So many things. Mm. Okay, and we have. I often, Lauren says, I often think of what I think would be a very unpleasant untoward neutron imaging experiment to study the so called radical pair mechanism of avian navigation. <laughs> navigation. But we can talk about that some other time. Yes, I, I, <laughs> yeah. yes, I'd like to discuss that with you. That would be interesting. Unpleasant. Okay, excellent. So if we have no more questions to Pascal or to the rest of the team, so I think it's a, it's, it was a perfect uh, presentation, very comprehensible as well, and we can uh, so come back to more questions later, if needed, as we said. So thank you very much, uh, Pascal, and we have uh, um, as well the possibility yeah, to see the next presentation. So next time we'll be focusing on engineering development as well, thanks to the ESS, so by uh, Robin. So I think it will be also quite interesting next Tuesday at the same time, so at 3.30. So thank Tuesday. you everybody and uh, Alex as well for, for your, your nice uh, contribution. So bye everybody and I'm going to stop the presentation. Okay, thank you. Bye, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot Pascal.